Welcome to the semi-finals of the lower bracket here in Templars of the Arena 2. We have Beast and Marine Lord facing off against Lucifron and Vortex. And we will have with the cold colors Lucy and Vortex with the Rus and the Ottomans. Other side, it is going to be Marine Lord and Beastie playing with the English and the Abbasids. Now, this is not a composition that I've seen Beastie and Marine Lord play very often. So I'm actually curious how they will approach this. And it looks like right from the get-go, they will just skip round number one for Tex. We'll only have a scout for Beastie. We will have quite a bit of commitment to units from Lucifron and Vortex. That means that round number one will be easily secured by them. In fact, I would love to see these scouts just deleted, just to save some time. Oftentimes, players do that when they know that they cannot win. You see, Marine Lord did that, so did Beastie. They probably wanted to check what the opponents went for, though. So, I guess the idea of keeping those units alive a little longer kind of comes down to two things. A, you want to see what your opponent committed to. How many techs could they have gotten that you can kind of estimate based on how many units they fielded. You also look at the unit, the unit types that they went for. And to be honest, given that you have a preset amount of time before each round, you can also use these little windows to get some extra time to think about the future rounds. So you can see Beast and Marine Lord kind of keeping those scouts alive, maybe to get some extra seconds to discuss things, or as I said, simply to just check out what the opponents went for. Now it's going to be some uh, Ghulams supported by some crossbows, not something that you commonly see from the English player. Generally, as you see, now it's Lucifer and Vortex skipping the second round here. Um, so generally, the unit of choice for the English is the longbow. It's a very oppressive unit, especially when you have the network of Citadel Zora that you can grab from uh, the network of castles, or, well, the network of Citadel's tech here. And, of course, having the king out there, which provides you with the aura itself. But it's also a different factor that actually comes into play here in this game mode. The longbows can deploy the palings, and the palings will stagger cavalry. This is not really a factor in RM games because you have to move and attack. But here, where you can just stand and fight, these palings are actually very valuable. It's going to be longbows and gulams facing off against some archers, some janissaries, a couple of warrior monks as well being mixed in, and there's a mangonel too. Now, a lot comes down to Marine Lord here. How well is he going to snipe that mangonel? There is no king on Beastie's side, so he doesn't have the network of castles aura. He's trying to focus down the archers. We'll likely try to pick the warrior monks now. Janissaries are kind of glass cannon over here. They can do well against the Ghulam, but they are kind of anti-cavalry units here. So the Longbows actually do a great job against them. You feel like this composition was kind of designed to deal with cavalry coming in? The Janissaries would have sniped the cavalry and then archers just deal with whatever spears come out from the Abbasid player, for instance. But I don't like this composition for Vortex and Lucifron. As I said, I, this composition felt like an anti-cav composition in many ways. And that's not something that you commonly see, cavalry that is, from Abbasids and the English. Abbasids just want to go for either Ghulams or archers themselves. Likely Ghulams. Technically, you could see some horsemen or, dare I say, even lancers, but it's unlikely. This is why I feel like Janissaries in this matchup is not something that you want to go for if you are the Ottomans. Looks like we will have Ghulam plus Longbow once again. Beastie is going for the network of Citadels, but he didn't mix in a king. It's actually awkward because the only way that you get the buff is if you actually have a king on the field. In the meantime, we've seen some monk techs come in for Lucifer as well. They go for limited troops here. Just a handful of Janissaries, but you see, they know fully well that they cannot win this round. And they will just step back from it. Beast and Marine Lord move on to three points on the board. And as things stand, you feel like they have a lot of momentum here. Both teams in Imperial, two-point lead for Beast and Marine Lord. And so far, we haven't really seen any dominant wins for Vortex and Lucy. In fact, we haven't really seen a lot of engagements altogether. We've seen this kind of back and forth. Um, between the teams when it comes to stepping back from around, trying to prioritize technologies. And right now, it looks like we we will also have somewhat limited of a commitment in terms of units from both sides. Just a handful of units coming out. Quite a bit of siege from Vortex, but they are facing a lot of Ghulams. You feel like this comp, once again, is just so much better for Beast and Marine Lord. They outnumber their opponents 3-1. to one. 
Rebolt Queen obviously is a great tool to deal with melee units, but you need some sort of uh, meat shield in front of it, something that shields it from the melee. Nice use of the longbows here by Beastie to pick off the archers, and then the Gulam will just deal with the siege. A very one-sided round this is. Quick win for Beastie and Marine Lord, and right now they are just cruising on with that momentum. They are already at the map point. This is a best of three, so even if you win this round, um, you will have to fight at least one more battle. But we'll talk about that once we get there. It's going to be heavy techs coming in for Beast and Marine Lord. But given that Lucy and Vortex kind of undercommitted to army in preceding rounds, even with limited army, we could see some success here for Beast and Marine Lord. Having said that, Lucy and Vortex went for limited army in almost every single round. You feel like they've been building up towards this late game. I just feel like this might be a little too late. Now, this round, Beast and Marine Lord will just step back. Not a single combat unit out there. You have three villagers for Beastie, but that's all. They will check on what the opponent is doing. You see, he's not deleting them immediately. In fact, he wants to see... <laughs> uh, Vortex just deleted all his cavalry, seeing that there is no enemies that needs to be fought. Still, this is going to be the second point on the board for Vortex and Lucy. Now we have both teams with full techs, and we have a great bombard on the way for Vortex. All right. They've gotten a lot of techs. They've definitely been playing towards this light game. And now you have the Saint's Blessing for the Warrior Monks. You'll have a lot of archers and a lot of Sipahis, supported by a single great bombard. On the other side, no siege at all. Beastie is going to go for a king now. He's actually mixing in Lancers. This is not something that you commonly see from the English player, and it will be an element of surprise over here. You feel like this composition will be so dominant. Gulams, they don't have a counter on the side of Lucian Vortex. Neither do Lancers. This kind of unconventional approach to go for the Lancers or the Knights for Beastie is not something that could have been anticipated by Vortex and Lucy. And these archers will be kind of useless in this combat situation. Camels will also be here to debuff the Sipahi. Great Bombard doing its best over here, but will be focused down by the Knights. Might survive over here. Nice little body blocks over here by Lucifron. Gulam still doing decent work. And don't forget, there is the matter buff out there. And of course, there is the Saint's Blessing too. So I may have underestimated the army here of Vortex and Lucy. But you see, there is one Camel over here still debuffing the Sipahi. Numbers looking a lot better for Vortex and Lucy. I just don't know what these archers can do against the heavily armored troops. I feel like these numbers are deceiving because these units, the units that Beast and Marine Lord have, they are hard counters to what Lucifer and Vortex do. Still, Matter would be nice to snipe over here for Beast and Marine Lord. That has been so annoying to deal with. It has given so much momentum and boost to the forces of Vortex and Lucy. And now Lucy is doing his best to micro away with the archers, but it just feels insufficient. The Ghulam getting some nice wraps and they're slowly grinding down the archers. This was a matter of unit compositions, and that element of surprise that Beastie brought in with the Lancers is something that kind of caught Lucy and Vortex off guard. Unit composition was just better here in this final round. And with that, Beastie and Marine Lord will cruise on to a 1-0 lead in this best of three. A dominant um, series, I would say, for Beast and Marine Lord. But one of the things I've noticed is that we've seen a lot of these kind of just step backs from these rounds. A lot of the rounds weren't really fought. It was just kind of this chess battle of who gets the upper hand in terms of technology. We only had a handful of real battles that have been fought. Those were, though, quite dominant for Beastie and Marine Lord. Round number two, here we go. The first one was very dominant for Beastie and Marine Lord. Lucifon and the Vortex will look to turn that around. This time around, they will have the Ottomans and the French facing off against the Beastie and Marine Lord who have the English once again for Beastie. And this time around, Marine Lord will be having the HRE. Now, we have seen how dominant the English can be off the back of mass longbows at the network of Cerrado's aura. But also, we have seen some level of versatility when it comes to the unit choices from Beastie. He opted to go for Lancers in the final round, and that's something that has worked out rather well. This time around, it looks like we will have a tech focus for Beast and Marine Lord, kind of skipping round number one. But we have seen a lot of techs come in for Vortex and Lucy as well. So, despite the fact that they committed for quite a few units over here, actually, 
um, and they will be the ones securing the first round. They also went for a decent amount of techs, so the tech advantage isn't going to be gigantic on the side of Beast and Marine Lord, though they opted to go for Castleage a little quicker than their opponents. Now, one of the things that is remarkable to see with Marine Lord and Beastie, and we've seen this numerous times in the previous edition of this tournament, is how well Marine Lord is able to protect Beastie's siege with frontline units. We'll have to see if that's going to be a thing in this game, because I feel like Beastie won't really go for that much siege. He will just go for longbow, crossbow, and units like that. But Marine Lord has been so effective in the role of that frontline unit coordinator, if that makes sense. Um, and on the other side, we have Vortex and Lucy. They do have the Ottomans, which is a civilization that can be oppressive with the matter. But a lot will come down to how French is utilized. And I feel like Knights is not the unit type that I would love to see here from Vortex and Lucy. Though, in this specific round, it's going to work well against the Man in Arms. In the long run, Lucy France's go-to unit should be the Arboletrier. Now, this round, you kind of expect Vortex and Lucy to win this. They stuck in Feudal Age, so they went for a lot more units compared to Beast and Marine Lord. Beast and Marine Lord opted to go for the faster Castle Age. They will have a tech advantage still going into this round, but they had limited numbers available because of that in round number two. Looks like we will have Men at Arms techs coming in here for Marine Lord. And for Beastie, he's going to start playing into longbows. Now, one thing I've noticed with Beastie playing the English is that he doesn't really prioritize Network of Citadels and the King itself. Many other players go for it sooner. But so far, this approach worked out for Beastie, so if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Looks like we will still have a Knight commitment over here from Lucifron. He is not going to have Royal Bloodlines, though. And it's going to be crossbows for Vortex. He also has a Mangonel on the field. This is a decent composition over here. The Knights are a great frontline unit. The Longbows will struggle against them. And a lot will come down to how you... Oh, the Matter gets mismicroed. Vortex actually sent the matter forward. That's a big blunder, losing that buff unit so, so quickly. You see, men at arms do have maces here, so they do fairly well against the knights, but it all comes down to these longbows focusing down the crossbows. So far, nice job from Vortex picking off the men at arms. Crossbows are still alive, and I think enough lancers survive to just clean up these um, longbows with. Mangonel is still on the back line. This is going to be the third point on the board for Lucifron and Vortex. As dominant as, and as one-sided as the first game was in this series in the favor of Beast and Marine Lord, you feel like there is a, there is a similar kind of momentum for Vortex and Lucifron here. These rounds have been very dominant so far, though let's not forget, we have seen a high focus of upgrades for Beast and Marine Lord. And also, especially the English is a civilization that will come online by the second half of the game. So you see, now that we have the king out there, now that we'll have Network of Citadels with longbows, this is where you really start feeling that power spike for the English. On the other side, we will have knights and crossbows coming in. Again, this is a composition... This time around, though, you have spears. This is a big thing. Um, the spears that Marine Lord has is something that's going to hold back the knights, and that means that the longbows can creep forward to pick up the crossbows. This is a composition from Beast and Marine Lord that's much more suitable to take down this Knight plus Crossbow composition. King also a big factor over here, of course, although it looks like it's going to get sniped down almost instantly here as it charges into the battle. Mangonel also getting some good shots going, but Crossbows are focused down, and there is no counter unit to the Spearman over here from Vortex and Lucifron. Spearman will close the distance. They do a lot of damage against the Knights. Knights are lacking the raw Bloodline stack, so they will die very quickly to the Spears here. And for the first time in this game specifically, we will have Beastie and Marine Lord on the board. No direct counter from Vortex and Lucifron against the Spears. Or, well, they did have a counter to Longbows with the Knights being there. Even the Mangonel there, I say. But as long as the Spearmen were available for Beast and Marine Lord, the Knights were just a non-factor in this battle. I'm actually curious whether Lucifron will continue playing at the Knights here. It looks like he's going to go Gambesons and Crossbow Stirrups now, just skipping this round for Tex. The interesting thing was that he decided not to go for Royal Bloodlines. 
it's a pricey tech, but especially if you go for knights for multiple rounds, you feel like you want to grab that tech. Nevertheless, Lucifer and Vortex will skip this round for technologies, and we will have cavalry mixed in here by Vortex, you see. He's gr grabbing biology. He's also grabbing the Sipahi tech. And on the other side, we'll just stick with the same composition here for Beastie and Marine Lord. It's going to be Arbaletrier now being the unit of choice for Lucifron, something that you commonly see for French players. It's a very cost-effective unit and looks like they will once again go for Tex. Now, two consecutive rounds in which they step back for Tex, it can work because going into round number eight, or round number seven actually, they will have a considerable Tex lead. But you also have to consider the fact that they've basically allowed Marine Lord and Beastie to creep back up on the scoreboard. It was a 3-0 lead, now it's three apiece. And as much as they will have the tech advantage, I feel like Lucifer and Vortex are taking a huge gamble here. It's gonna be a cleanup. And you see, Marine Lord and Beastie also went for a lot of crucial techs early on. So it's not like their tech disadvantage is going to be gigantic. There's probably going to be some level of advantage for Vortex and Lucy here. But Beast and Marine Lord can kind of compensate for that with Network of Citadels. Um, they also have most of their key techs secured early on. HRE loves to grab those techs in early Castle HD. Maces, um, Marching Drills as well. All these upgrades come in in early Castle Age. So the critical upgrades have already been researched by Marine Lord. And Beast does have, obviously, that late game prowess of the English. So I feel like... Doing two consecutive rounds of tech rounds here, as I like to call them, for Vortex and Lucy, is just a risky move, because you've given two points to your opponent for free, so you really need to make this work out in this round specifically. And also the next one, to be honest. Great Bombard setting up over here, Staggered Formation will make it difficult for it to do damage. And you see, Spearman will just charge in, Sipa is trying to flank around for the longbows, beautiful shots by the Mangonel and the Great Bombard as well, but the Sipahis do get caught by the Spearman. Longbows doing a decent job splitting up, focusing down the archers as well, and you see the Spearman managed to close the distance. They didn't get to reach the Mangonel though, the siege weapons are still out there for Vortex and Lucifron. And the crossbows are standing, numbers looking still better for Lucifer and Vortex. Mangan and Great Bombard doing a lot of work, and it looks like Lucifer and Vortex will secure this round. A much needed round after stepping back from two consecutive rounds in order to get some techs going. Now it is a map point for Vortex and Lucifron. First game was won by Beastie and Marine Lord, so. If we see one more round secure here by Vortex and Lucifron, we will see a decider game. Marine Lord and Beastie need two consecutive rounds to move on to the winner's bracket finals. They will stick with the same composition, but this time they will mix in some anti-siege. Culverins those are, and I don't see any of that here from Vortex and Lucy. It's essentially identical compositions for Lucy and Vortex, and kind of for Beast and Marine Lord as well. The only difference are those two Culverins, We'll have to see how big of a difference they actually make. If you can snap the Great Bombard, that's great, but I think your primary focus will be the Mangonels. They also have a Mangonel in here, makes it more difficult for those Arbaletriae to just stand ground here with the Pavises deployed. Culverins trying to get some fire going over here. Spearman being focused down by the Archers well here by Vortex and Lucy, but their siege is all gone thanks to the Culverins, and this is where the Mangonel factor comes into play. The Arbaletriae have to move, and the moment you move, you lose the Pavise. This single Mangonel forcing these Arbaletria to move makes it so much more problematic for Lucifron. The Pavise is not a buff that they can rely on anymore. And these two pieces of utility that you have here deployed for Beastie and Marine Lord, the Mangonel and the Culverins, they are the difference makers in these battles. These three pieces of siege weapons were the difference makers that made this round a win for Beast and Marine Lord compared to the previous one that was a loss. It's such a lovely adjustment over there. And you feel like we haven't really seen any kind of pivot away from that composition from Lucian Vortex. They must have anticipated some sort of counterplay to this, but you know, it, it's, it's difficult to make up your mind on what you do exactly. You have a composition that works. Are you switching into something 
and, you know, gamble that it's going to work out against what your opponent is switching into? Or are you sticking with something that worked well and just say, look, I want to see your adjustments first. Maybe your adjustment is wrong and we can secure another round with the same composition. Now it's going to be full archers and crossbows. Again, a single great bombard is mixed in, but zero anti-siege here from Vortex and Lucy. This time around, no mangonels from Beast and Marine Lord, though. Now, mangonels aren't mandatory here, but if you don't have mangonels, the Arbaletrier will stand and fight, making it much more difficult to pick them off because they will have the Pavisa buff for quite a while. Longbows, though, with the network of Citadels just shredding all the archers. Look at that rate of fire coming in from them. Beastie also has the volley upgrade. That combine or that combined with the network of Citadels just makes these longbows fire so, so quickly. The Culverin gets rid of the backline bombard and now is just volleys after volleys of arrows coming in from both sides. But this is where the network of Citadels comes into play. The Ottoman archers, they are powerful, but the matter is gone. They don't no longer have the buff. And the Arbaletria won't do very well against those longbows, especially now that they moved and the Pavisa buff has been removed. You see, they only have three ranged armor. They will be cleaned up easily here by the longbows. And round number nine will be secured by Beastie and Marine Lord. They will move on to the lower bracket finals with a chance to once again sweep the lower bracket, get back into the grand finals for a chance to win the second edition of the tournament. They were the champions of the first edition. We will have to see how they do in the lower bracket finals. For Vortex and Lucifron, this is the end of the ride here in the lower bracket. If there is a third edition of the tournament, that's the time that they can retry again. With this, this video ends. Hopefully you've enjoyed. If you did, I greatly appreciate it if you subscribe to the channel, if you like the video. These metrics help me a lot to get more recognition, more opportunities. So if you want to support my work and you enjoy this kind of content, I greatly appreciate if you support the channel in such a manner. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in the next cast.